Greetings, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thesis day, it's so exciting. I've been at MIT since 2012, and I've been to a fair number of these, and it's always exciting. So glad to see you all here. Um, we have uh, people coming in and out throughout the day, both in person and via Zoom. Um, and uh, again, thank you all for coming. We're gonna stick to a really rigorous schedule. You can see the clock in the back of the room might be helpful. I think it's about one minute fast, but that's okay. Um, so each presenter will go for 20 minutes and then it will have 10 minutes of Q&A and then a super quick change over to the next presenter. Um, and we'll be breaking for uh, lunch at one o'clock. So our first presenter today is Marvez, and the title of their uh, uh, thesis is Controversial Science Argumentation Skills for Teachers in the Digital Clinical Simulation Discussion Leader. Take it away. Thank you, Heather. I will share my screen. Okay. Can't do anything about the bar on the bottom. Hope you forget. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marvez. I'm a graduate student in comparative media studies and in the teaching systems lab. And today I'll be talking about a simulation I designed for my thesis, uh, designed to help teachers practice leading controversial discussions on um, issues with their students before they actually go and implement this lesson. And I focused on the ethics of gene therapy. So why are facilitated controversial discussions in school so important? Um, I, as a first year student teacher, I was 19, I was in an 11th and 12th grade AP English classroom, and uh, some of the students were the same age as me. And in that classroom, um, my mentor teacher I worked with cared a lot about debate. Um, he did this one exercise where I believe students read a bunch of pro and con articles about recycling, and for obvious reasons, all the students were pro recycling. And then he took on the con perspective and argued one against 20 against all the students. And being 19, brand new teacher, I thought that was both really exciting and terrifying and got me really interested in controversial discussions. A lot of people think controversial discussions are only a like social studies or a history class type of activity, but I think it's important to do in all the subjects. And the subject I focus on for this simulation is um, gene therapy. Right here at MIT, we are designing the gene therapies of the future from new mRNA technologies. Uh, just recently in the most recent issue of science, we've learned that a consortium of scientists have almost completely sequenced the human genome. And we're also having difficult conversations about who should be the stewards of the human race. When we design new gene therapies, we are deciding where humanity will go. And so I think that these discussions are really important for high school students to have to be the next generation of researchers, designers, and innovators. And I'm gonna come back to these research questions later, but I would like to briefly mention them here. I'm interested in mostly two things. How can we increase teachers' comfort in leading controversial discussions through a simulation? And through the simulation, can we study the teacher dialogue choices that they make and how those might differ from those with different levels of teaching experience? So this is a brief agenda of what I'm going to look at today. I'm mostly focused on chapter three and chapter four, which is my methodology and the results. So first, I would like to introduce a couple of problems of practice in teacher education. The first is that teacher candidates rarely have the opportunity just to practice one element teaching by, them, by itself, and they're evaluated on their ability to combine all aspects of teaching at once. This is just part of the Massachusetts rubric for assessing student teachers. And as you can see, there's a lot of things in just this one bullet point that teachers need to uh, additionally, for classroom controversy, a lot of teachers report that there are significant challenges to them teaching controversial issues, such as a lack of comfort, concern about pushback from parents, administration, and their top security, and a lack of instruction on how to teach controversial topics. Uh, even uh, despite these challenges, teachers report a strong desire for academic freedom in their classrooms, and they believe that teaching controversies are critical to democratic citizenship. We know that the classroom is one of the few places where students hear um, ideas outside of their ideological bubble, so we really need to foster this type of environment. <clears throat> So if teachers' comfort level is a strong predictor of whether they even engage in classroom discussions, this becomes before they plan to do a discussion with their students and they actually implement it. When they do implement it, there are some elements of a good discussion that can be practiced, such as enforcing classroom norms, asking open-ended questions. And there's also uh, recent challenges that have become a lot more difficult over the past few years, such as where does the teacher's opinion belong in a discussion and how can a teacher manage misinformation? 
And so it is on these four topics that I see that there's an opportunity to design simulations. Not only do you need a skill at leading difficult discussions, you need to rehearse your knowledge on the topic, enforce classroom norms, and also work on your digital literacy skills with your students to combat misinformation. And this is where we have the opportunity to improve the practice of improvisational interactions um, that we'll see in the simulation I described later. So for at least the last 60 years, we've been working on the difficult problem of getting teachers to practice um, difficult elements of teaching um, in different technologies and mediums. In 1962, Kirsch describes the classroom simulator, which is um, a projection environment in which a teacher would stand in front of a projector, watch some classroom moments, and then um, a panel of experts would decide if uh, the teacher responded appropriately and queue up the next video sequence. What was interesting about this from the 60s is that you had to do it correctly. If you didn't do it right, they would make you do it over and over again. And in the 70s to 90s with the rise of um, home computing, we see a lot more um, computer games for teaching, uh, for teaching teachers how to balance lots of classroom tasks all at once. What I'm affectionately calling TSL at all from 2019 or 2018 to today is this platform called Teacher Moments, um, which is a digital platform to create simulations about teacher education, especially in topics of equity and around difficult elements of teaching. In Teacher Moments, you can do linear scenarios, branching scenarios like I will describe here, and use um, audio, text, and AI backend to capture data. And now I'd like to talk about specifically the evolution of the discussion leader suite. And discussion leader is a type of practice space specifically designed to help uh, practice uh, leading a controversial discussion. Our original version was a linear implementation made in Google Slides where you would type in what you say. And no matter what you said, um, the simulation progressed the same way about immigration policy. And then we eventually moved to Twine, which is a choose your own adventure game engine, um, where we created this branching, math, uh, branching path model, again, about immigration policy with over 100 paths and about um, 12 different endings. Um, this is due to a lot of the feedback and iteration we got from playtests from people who are like, I want this to be more responsive to me. And then in our Twine implementation, we only had three or four students in every scenario. And we were told that try to get as many students as you can. So we thought about how can we get as many student voices in this discussion as possible without making it too computationally complex. So with teacher moments being able to take in branching path models, we were able to have 20 different student voices in our discussions. And we piloted one version about freedom of speech in a MOOC. And then the current implementation I'm talking about today is a branching path model on gene editing ethics. This one has over 4 million paths, uh, 21 to the fifth possible options. And there's structured challenges centered around the elements of a good discussion. Five different student groups you speak with, and at each group, the difficulty gets harder and there's a different skill to practice. So I'd like to bring up our research questions again. I'm really interested in how we can improve people's comfort, and we do this through a self-report survey. And then looking at the teacher dialogue choices and how they differ by analyzing the paths that There's a box around this. Um, so in this simulation, participants take on the role of a high school biology teacher near the end of a genetics unit. They're told that students have read two opposing articles for homework, one about cystic fibrosis treatments and one about editing embryos. And they're um, discussing this broader question, if genetic modification treatments in humans should be allowed, to what extent and why? And so they have a class of 20 students split into five groups of four, and each group focuses on a different scale that I will show in the next couple of slides. Um, and these also align with the Massachusetts State Standards for High School Science. So this is an actual lesson that you could teach with your high school students. Uh, so the simulation flow is that uh, the participants see the same introduction that I just gave you. I collect some data and some demographic information, and then they, they answer some anticipate questions about the possible discussion strategies they are going to utilize. And then for the five groups, they speak to the student group and make different dialogue choices, reflect, and then they reflect on the simulation as a whole. So these are the five skills I'm having teachers practice during the simulation. Uh, and these are in order of increasing difficulty. First, one is just practice asking probing questions, not asking these simple yes or no's. Group two focuses on exploration versus telling. Um, students in this group want you to want the teacher to give them the answer. So how do you work through the problem with students? Uh, the third group is practicing whether to disclose a personal opinion to students. The fourth one is having very low engagements and how do you work with those students? And the fifth one is working on digital information with your students. This is a visualization of just um, what one path could be like through group one. On the left, you see the original bit of student dialogue that participants will see, and they make some uh, teacher dialogue choice. They get new dialogue, they make another choice, they get new dialogue and make their final choice, and then they get a final bit of student dialogue that acts as a bit of feedback for them for how they did in the scenario. And I'm gonna be representing these paths that people make using these tree diagrams. Everyone starts at the black start node, and then based on their first level decision is put into one of these possible 21 paths. 
And this is what it could look like for someone who goes through all five groups um, and how they end up on different paths, but go through all of them in the same order. So I got 42 people to participate in this experiment. Um, there were undergraduate and graduate education students, uh, fellows in a community to teacher program, high school teachers, and college professors. And I'm interested in stratifying the data out by how many years of teaching experience people had. And there's a pretty good spread between uh, non-teachers, novice teachers, and expert teachers. And 50% of participants reported that they had previously led a controversial discussion in the past. So for my first research question, I'm really interested in this change of comfort. I asked at the beginning and the end of the scenario, how comfortable are you with leading a controversial discussion? And there was an increase from 2.95 to 3.69, and this is a significant change. We can see in the delta column here that we got a lot of people out of slightly uncomfortable and a lot of people up into slightly comfortable. And then when we stratify this out by years of experience, we see that everyone goes up. Um, the more than five only goes up slightly, which is expected for teachers who are already really confident. Uh, with their students and their material. The greatest gain was for those with less than five years of teaching experience, whole point up 2.5 2.5. I think this is really great because even if you're a novice teacher with one or two years of experience, that's still a lot of teaching experience. So how can we just get you comfortable with teaching controversial issues in your classroom? So now I'm gonna go through each of the five groups and the first level choices that people made and how um, this is, and how these are different based on their years of experience. So in the first group, the participant approaches the table. It's an easy growing group of four students and they're having a calm discussion. And all you have to do is practice asking open-ended questions. And you can, these are the three levels of choices that people could make. They could ask an open-ended question, a limited open-ended question, or a closed question. And we see that those with less teaching experience were more likely to uh, start the conversation with a closed question. And those with more teaching experience were more likely to begin the conversation with the most open-ended question. I'm also going to be showing for each of the groups the most common paths that people went on. Path 35 and path 36 were the most common here. But for those with more than five years of teaching experience, 36 was the most common. So what is the difference between these two paths? There's only, these are the same except for the last uh, final dialogue choice. In path 35, uh, these participants told the group it seems like they have more to discuss and you leave them to check on the next group. But for path, thir path 36 favored by those with more experience, you ask, the, you ask another open-ended question to the students. So I think this is an interesting um, teacher dialogue choice by experience. For group two, this is about student-directed discussion. The students have a technical question to ask you that you know the answer to, but um, you can choose to give them the answer or let them figure it out for themselves. And we can see here that the those, again, with <clears throat> more than five years of teaching experience were much less likely to do the teacher-directed op uh, option and were more likely to do student-directed or a prior knowledge question. And for this one, the participants were much more spread out over the simulation uh, with lots of paths being favored, especially in the no experience group. Uh, path 27 was um, pretty common, but um, what was interesting is that the participants with zero teaching experience, none of them utilized path 27 and they actually made choices that caused them to leave the discussion early and move on to the next group. For group three, the students are have you get to the table, it's described as being loud, they're having a very excited debate and they want to know the teacher's opinion. So you can share your opinion, decline to share, or ask them what they think first. And we see that only those with no experience outright decline to share the initial part. And those uh, with more teaching experience, 22% of participants actually shared their opinion as the first choice. Uh, path 31 was the most common for these participants. And in this one, you ask the group for their opinion first, um, decline to share your opinion again. And then you, they sort of ask this one student who's been playing devil's advocate the whole time if they have a different um, take on the issue. Only 29% um, of participants ever chose to share their opinion on genetic editing with the group. In the um, anticipate section, we asked participants um, what they thought about teacher opinion, and this was very rarely mentioned. And of participants who reached an opportunity to reinforce classroom norms to keep students from talking over each other, 93% uh, chose to do so. In group four, this group is not participating participating at all. And you notice that one of the students has actually gone to the bathroom during the discussion. So you can start with an open participation, a more disciplinary statement, or summarize what other students have said. And we see that only those with no experience take the disciplinary track, but those with any teaching experience have a sort of even split between an open participation question or summarizing what others have said. Uh, path 15 remained, uh, was the most common for group four. And it's to ask the group what they discuss as a whole, ask one student what she thinks, and then ask others if they agree or disagree. Um, in the scenario, there's a moment where um, the, the student who's missing comes back from the bathroom and actually only two participants of 13 um, even engage with that student at all, I think is really interesting. 
And then for the misinformation group, uh, you get to this group, again, it's described as another loud, excited group. Um, they're having a lively debate, but you get there and you realize the article is a piece of misinformation that you've seen before. So you can investigate the misinformation with the students, um, deflect, or just tell them outright, you already know that's false, close your Chromebook, let's get back on it. Um, so those with less teaching experience were more likely to um, just shut down the students right at the beginning. And those with more teaching experience were more likely to say, so where did you get that source from? And that's exactly what we see in the most common paths uh, 13 here. The path 13 is to ask Jude to explain about the source that she is showing her group. And you ask the team, well, what organization published this article? You ask Jude to search up World Daily News Report in another tab. When you do so, you can go to Wikipedia and you see that this is a satirical website. Uh, this is the fact-checking seal called lateral reading, which the Stanford History Education Group has done a lot of um, research on. It's one of the most like powerful fact-checking tools we can um, use as teachers to um, get our students to work through misinformation. So I would um, like to reconnect to the research questions. Our first one about comfort, we see that this can be a tool in increasing confidence for, leech, for leading controversial discussions. Um, all groups saw an, an increase and the largest confidence boost was for novice teachers. Again, I wanna stress that novice teachers does not mean having any experience. Um, even new teachers have lots of great experience and they know their students and their school and their material. So how can we just get them um, ready to teach these controversial issues? And then for the second research question about um, analyzing the different moves that people with different levels of experience make, more experienced participants tended to select the choices that allowed the students to control the debate. And those with less experience were more likely to ask the teacher directed question. And by analyzing the common uh, teacher dialogue choices, we can show where teachers diverge in their decisions. I've only showed here what happens at the first um, choice point. Um, I will explore more in my thesis what happens at every other point. Um, in the future, I would love to be able to expand the possible teacher dialogue choices based on participant feedback. Um, I asked participants in the scenario, was there anything you wanted to do in the scenario that was not an option for you? We got a lot of great results from that. So taking their feedback, integrating it in and giving them more options that are more authentic to their experience. And also working on um, generative response student dialogue using something like a BERT model trained on student discussions would be great in which everyone sees the same starting piece of student dialogue, you type in your response, <clears throat> it's analyzed by um, NLP methods, and then it generates a completely novel new um, student dialogue for you to respond to. The simulation I designed for my thesis is already very replayable, there's lots of different paths, but I think it would be really interesting to develop something that's completely novel every time you play it. <clears throat> and finally, um, this was my original thesis idea that got cut down by COVID. Um, doing A-B tests in classrooms where people would complete the simulation and then have teachers implement this lesson with their students and compare that against a no simulation control group with the same lesson and analyze are the dialogue choices different between those teachers and those students. Um, and now I'd like to do some acknowledgements. Um, obviously, people funded this. Thanks. Uh, the Teaching Systems Lab, the uh, graduate program in CMS and the NSF uh, Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Um, the Teaching Systems Lab, because I've been here for four years and I'm going to cry. Um, so it's my first like conference and, you know, to presenting my master's thesis today. And, you know, my friends and family, this is the only photo I could find of the CMS cohort on Zoom. <laughs> so we have to take a good one today. Um, you know, everyone who's helped me on my um, thesis ideas and for grad school. So thank you, everyone. I'll now take questions. <laughs> Yep. Uh, great presentation. It sounded like there's a theme going from novice teachers to more experienced teachers and the willingness to give up the goal. Yeah. Is that something that you noticed and did you look into that initially? Like, what kinds of factors would make someone comfortable to give up control or think about it as an option? Yeah, so we definitely see in like um, discussion theme teacher literature that this is like one of the biggest things to having a productive discussion. It's really hard to let the students go off and have their own ideas with each other like in a Socratic seminar because you're afraid or oh, what if someone says something inflammatory or what if it completely goes off the rails. So that's why establishing um, these norms early with your students and co-creating these norms, I think is really important to fostering a classroom environment where you feel comfortable enough as a teacher where it's like that will not happen. And if it does, my students are responsible enough to pause in the discussion and return to norms. What do you know about implementation and, and how 
simulations like this uh, end up being used, how they get into training programs, and then uh, where they, I mean, I, I guess, uh, do, does one expect these controversial issues to be discussed in general? Would you expect more private schools to be interested in something like this than public schools? Because it's, you know, obviously, um, there are plenty of school districts that are uh, would like to have no controversial discussions whatsoever in the classroom. And so how do you tackle that issue, which is political and is outside of your research in many ways, and yet impacts like the implementation of all the work that you've done? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things the Teaching Systems Lab has done is um, hosted um, MOOCs on, for teacher training about different um, equity issues and embedded the simulations within them. Um, also, the Teacher Moments platform is like free and open source. So if you're really curious, you could go and do the simulation right now. But I think the dissemination is a really um, interesting problem. Because like you said, a lot of laws are currently being passed that keep um, teachers from talking about controversial issues in the classroom. So how can we um, you know, work with those teachers to still make sure that they are meeting their students' needs of being able to have democratic dialogue. Justin. Well, how do you interpret some of the, you know, these are five main scenarios. Some of them people tend to diverge on one pathway, and some of them they diverge across multiple pathways. How do you interpret that difference from both a design point of view and a kind of analytic point of view? Yeah, so we saw that on like groups of five and three had the most convergence and group two was all over the place. And so it is interesting to consider, was this a design artifact? Did I as the designer make the answer too obvious for some people or are people really experimenting and trying out lots of different things um, in their path? So um, in my thesis, uh, the write-up I will explore further about like, was this actually an artifact of the design or are people making these sort of novel uh, interesting themselves? Josh. Um, what type of feedback? So you mentioned wanting to sort of include some feedback in the relation. What type of feedback would you want to give people as they were going through the different uh, stages of the simulation? Yeah, it's a good question. Oh, yes. Uh, so Josh asked, what types of feedback would I give to participants in the simulation? So one of the anticipation questions that participants saw was um, exactly the same scenario from five. It says, uh, you, you get to a discussion and you notice that students are discussing a piece of misinformation as if it's true and you already know that it's misinformation. What will you do? And a lot of the responses that people said was, I would talk to them after class or I would ignore it. Not a lot of confronting it in the moment. So that's a piece where I would love to be able to give some feedback to people oh, it looks like you might've said that you would have waited until after the discussion to talk with the student, but it's actually really important to confront misinformation when it happens. So that would be a great moment um, to give feedback to people. Tomas? So, thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering how specific do you find this like, for example, or maybe uh, for professional, or it could be something positive in conversation with the students? Yeah, so how could like, um, civic engagement, like uh, people who work in schools use these type of tools? So, for example, uh, people who work in, uh, well, so for example, when a government or, um, like, for example, a civic engagement professional can facilitate conversations like that. Mm -hmm. How do you feel this sort of flexibility? Do you think there's something specific to schools or do you think it's just some sort of Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Tomas asked if there could, if this platform is specific to schools or could be used in other areas. I do think that this design could be used in other areas to encourage um, discussions, like um, not only in the civics field, but in lots of different areas in politics and other controversial issues. Um, just my interest is in education, but I do think it could be used in many different places to prepare people to have controversial discussions. Meredith? One of the things that I'm curious about, because we didn't see all the answers, is is there a perfect path through the simulation? Did anybody take that perfect path? And then the, the, the corollary of this is um, it seems like there are some right answers and there aren't some right answers. Can you explain a little bit about how you define it? Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Uh, Meredith asked, are there any right answers through the simulation? Um, I did not design any path to be specifically like the prime path, like this is the optimal solution. 
because with the replayability of simulations, I wanted people to be able to go back and explore different um, methods they could take with their students. So there's not really necessarily a right answer. There's things that sort of engage students more. But no matter what you pick, the discussion doesn't sort of shut down and end horribly. In the original version of Discussion Leader, I did have that actually, where the students would stop talking and your classroom descended into chaos. Uh, but participants told me that was not conducive to their learning, surprisingly. Uh, so I took that out. So it's really more a tool of like exploration of different skills. Thank you, everyone.